My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder. How do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Eric Van Horn here with today's guest, Cameron Harold. Cameron has been in franchising from early on. He got to start in the painting industry, moved over to 1-800-GOT-JUNK and exploded that uh, company with Brian Scudamore. He's written numerous books, Meeting Suck, Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs, uh, among many others like Free PR. But today we're going to talk about franchising, all kinds of things related to what's going on in today's world. Um, and so Cameron's been on the show before. I love this guy. He's added so much value to me and my life and has helped me um, as a business owner. So I wanted to bring him on to help everybody out. When you were doing that little intro, I, I thought of something that I, I don't even know if you know, but I've actually been a franchisee for three years and I was on a franchisor side twice in four different countries. So I've played the franchisee for three years and the franchisor a couple of times, and I've coached probably seven or eight franchisors as well. So I've been around the space a little bit and I, and I understand what it's like to be a franchisee where I think it's really, you know, easy to be an expert on the franchisor side, but not a lot have actually stood in the shoes of the franchisee. So I get it. Oh yeah. And man, right now they're going through it. We got about 500 franchisees in this group, a couple of franchisors that are friends of mine. And what came, question came up the other day about what they should be doing as they're getting ready to to open and operate coming out of this because we've been preparing this group really well and okay. to to manage everything right now. But like, put yourself in the CEO position. You're coaching a COO of a good franchisor. Yeah, what would you be doing? What would you be doing right now? I'm I'm actually going to go back for first. I'm going to go back to my franchisee position because I was a franchisee in 1986. And my second year was 87 when the, the 87 stock market crash happened and it hit really, really hard. Um, it was called Black Monday. It completely evaporated the markets. People went into complete panic and I was operating my franchise in the middle of that and then did it again in 1988. So through two big periods of recession, the one thing I remember doing at the time was I was so scared that I just did whatever was in the manual. <laughs> and I didn't understand it at the time because I was young. I was 21 years old. I had 12 full-time employees. I was scared I was going to go bankrupt. And uh, my dad was an entrepreneur. He'd give me all these ideas. And I kept, kept kind of going, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I wouldn't do anything he would tell me because all I was going to do was what the manual told me to do. And I remember thinking to myself years later when, when I was kind of the second in command building out 1-800-GOT-CHUNK that a franchisee would call me and my answer became RTFM. It was like, read the f manual. And, <laughs> and I, became, I became known as like irritatingly correct because I would always point back to the manual for the answer. And the franchisees always wanted the new, new thing. I'm like, dude, if it's new, it's going to be in the manual. Like the newest of the new will be in the manual. And if it's not, we will tell you it's not in the manual and we'll tell you. To, but I think the, the best advice, and it's hard because franchisees are entrepreneurial. And they mm -hmm. want to bust free and they want to do it on their own. And, and if they've been doing it for a year or two, they're, they're probably even pissed off at the franchise or they're even paying royalties. They don't like that whole stage they're in. Natural shit. But I would really encourage them to just do what's in the manual. And, and the, the best example of this I think I have as a child, when we're two years old, you know, we hit there. When, when we're one year old, our parents are amazing, right? They give us food, they wipe our butt, they, they nurture us, they put us to sleep. There are everything. We do everything our parents want us to do when we're one. When we're two, we kind of bust through, right? The terrible twos. No, 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 me, 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 no, no, no. And then we, then we become teenagers and we just want to, like our parents are assholes and we hate them. And then we're like 20 and we got to get out of the house. We got to go do our own thing. And then all of a sudden we get to be like 26 and we're like, I don't know how to do all this stuff around the house that my parents were doing. Like I'm making the same three dishes for dinner every night. And then we become 30-ish and we have our first kids and we're like, whoa, maybe my parents weren't the idiots that I thought they were after all. And that's the natural life cycle of a human. And if franchisees go through that same life cycle where we're so excited we get the franchise. And then after about six months, we're pretty convinced that it's only going to be because of us that we're successful. 
And then all of a sudden we're like, why the fuck am I paying royalty to these people? And I can't stand paying royalties to them. And then it's like, well, they're kind of smart, but they're not as smart as they were when I bought the franchise, but they're okay, but they're not the smartest people in the world. And then it's like, you know what? They've got some really good shit. If I do all their really good shit and I ignore the stuff that drives me crazy and I do all the stuff I'm really good at, we could really launch this sucker. And I think that's the biggest lesson I have for every franchisee right now is trust the franchisor has your best interest at heart because the bigger you get, the more money they're going to make and the more franchises are going to sell. Even from a pure greed perspective, they want you to do well. And they will tell you the best stuff to do because it's in the manual. So we're talking, um, and I love that. And and we all go through, I've, I've, I've gone through it. And as I'm creating this, uh, the new roofing franchise that I'm starting as a franchisor, it, we're looking at this and knowing that franchisees are going to, to experience that. Even though behind the scenes right now, Cameron, we are franchisee focused, like the decisions, the filter that we have is about the franchisee, totally. but being, you know, but you know, they're not Same always going to see that. Same with parents, right? Like it's, it's heartbreaking. My kids were 18 and 16 and, and I'm watching them right now, just, just turning 19 and 17, just kind of getting ready to bust free from the house. And we still have that really good relationship, but at times I can see it in their eyes. They go, dude, you're just an asshole. And, and I only have their best interests at heart, but they just don't quite know it yet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or when they're 13 and they're just complete jerks to you and you're like, God, like, what am I even bothering for? Let's talk about what should be in that manual. What makes a grant great franchisor great? Like when you get in there, because I know franchisors that they don't have the manual. Yeah. You don't want to mess with that. So we're talking about good franchisors that are probably getting coaching from someone like you. They have experience. And what does a great franchisor look like from like, like what would they be saying right now? What would they be doing? They're obsessed about franchisee profitability first and foremost. They're obsessed about the brand and the image and following the systems because the systems will remove the PETA factor. It'll remove the pain and the ass factor of running the business day to day. So they're trying to make it easier for the franchisee to, to remove obstacles, to free up their time and to free up their resources. But they're really trying to teach the franchisor or franchisee how to do the things that will yield the most money and kind of get them into orbit, right? It's, I always talk about like launch it into orbit so that you become that perpetual motion machine and then launch it to the next stage. So that the manual and the system should be the very specific step-by-step -step instructions on how to do each thing. You know, at College Pro Painters, it was right down to the keychain was supposed to be yellow. At 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we showed people exactly how to hang the signs out into the marketplace, like where to put the nail and how high to, to put it. Like we got really, really anal retentive on the specifics, but it made it easy for the franchisee to not have to think. You mentioned before one of the, when you were on the podcast with Brian Holmes and I on the Franchise Story podcast, you said, if you uh, don't have a, an assistant, you are one. You said something like that. Yeah. And I know that in your, from an operation standpoint, just talk to like at the franchisor level and the franchisee level, sure. how important is it to have that second in command, but then also have somebody that supports that second in command? I think it's really for the person to realize that we can't become successful and grow if we're doing everything that at certain points you have to delegate everything except genius and you're trying to get things off your plate that are below your effective hourly rate. So let's say that as a franchisee, you want to earn $200,000 in profit this year. That means your effective hourly rate is $100 an hour. You should be delegating everything less than $100 an hour task. So if you find yourself working on the administrivia, the tiny little things, the stuff that's not necessarily going to grow the business, you delegate that, you know, get mm -hmm. that stuff off your plate so that you can show up and do exactly what you're in your circle of genius with. And I think often the franchisees uh, and franchisors spend time working on the paper, working on the numbers, working on stuff instead of out there doing sales, doing marketing, you know, growing the business, interacting with the customers, interacting with the employees, growing their people, you know, more than ever, it's all about that. So right now we're in the middle of uh, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus and people are closed or they're like me that are closed and we're trying to do things to keep our build value, to yeah. give value for our customers. And some franchises that I know, they, they've gone on a shoestring budget and then others have done the opposite. Like, you know, Bedros Koulian, I don't think he's let anybody go and they're right. going full on and people like him and he was on here earlier they're going full on and they see, gosh, the, there is an end to this now. We know that the, you know, the curve is starting to bend or there's talk of that now. 
there is an end, customers will be coming in. And I know some smart people are putting money into marketing right now and they're actually getting better deals, better, better yeah. cost per click, cost per lead. I'm glad you mentioned Bedros. I, I actually used to coach Bedros with Fit Body Bootcamp. I should reach out to him and, um, and their team and just see how, how they're doing. I don't know the exact timeline. My guess is that we're going to be allowing, my, my benchmark is we will allow like restaurants to open and planes to be flying all over the US and you know uh, retail stuff to be open. My guess is it's going to be the kind of middle of July. I'm a little bit of a pessimist on it, but I'm trying to actually be a realist. But I think we have to plan for you know, three solid more months of shit. That's what I've been thinking too. I mean, I've been pessimistic. I feel like I'm pessimistic, but I think I'm being more of a realist. And if I'm a month off in a good way, then then yeah. that's incredible. I'd rather be pessimistic and wrong than optimist, or sorry, op- pessimistic and right than optimistic and wrong. I have a client of mine who's based in Milan, Italy. So he's based in the center of the Italian hotspot. And we were talking two weeks, two and a half weeks ago now about what's happening there. We've talked every week now since. And it's just interesting to hear what's really happening there. And they're, they're a full month and a half to two months ahead of us. And they're still in complete lockdown with no, no signs of letting up in Milan. So, you know, if you think about, we really haven't hit the hot spots yet in the U S other than, than Manhattan probably. Right. So you, you, so what should they be working on? For sure. One of them is growing themselves and growing their people, mm-hmm. right? Anything they can do to grow their own skill set. You know, often when we're really busy, we don't have time to devour the content. We don't have time to reread the manual. We don't have time to, to watch the online videos. We don't have time to do online courses. Whether it's paid or free, there's a lot of information out there that you can be devouring right now to grow yourself. So I'd be dedicating an hour a day for you and your people minimum to grow your skill set as a leader, to grow your skill set as a business person, um, grow your skills around marketing, et cetera. You mentioned marketing. Right now, marketing is as cheap as it's ever been. I've got a client of mine who spends $5 million a year in marketing. And he went out to all the outlets that he purchases from, whether it's Google and Facebook and billboards and radio and TV. And he went to all the groups that he purchases from and he said, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either cutting my budget by 30% or you're going to give me 30 to 80% more traffic and more impressions and more views for the same dollars I'm spending today, your choice. Every single outlet came back and gave him between 30 and 80% more. So he kept his $5 million, but now he's getting 30 to 80% more. He was happy with his buys two months ago. Now he's tripping over himself with happiness. So big opportunity for him to be building a long-term brand. And he's going to come out of the gates really fast because he's locking down six to 12 month buys. What's that mindset? Someone that thinks like that abundance it's abundance it's somebody who is not in a scarcity mindset he's in abundance now mind you his business is also fairly operational right he's still he's not in a complete lockdown where he can't operate so my sister's company went from you know about a million dollars a month to zero because she runs co-ed in real sports leagues and she can't operate at all so she's got you know a hundred thousand people playing her leagues and she went to zero with a bullet and she has to wait just like a lot of studios do to be able to reopen so a little different if you're in that space, redo your website, you know, get the copy done, work on your SEO, start working on your press strategy, um, work on your creative, work on, your, on, on getting the, your next year of, of content and creative all done. Um, build out all of the videos and blog posts into a queue so that you have you know, 50 videos done. You, know, you could actually walk in today, do five videos wearing this shirt, change your shirt, do five more videos, take off my glasses, do three more videos, put on a sweater, do 10 more videos. I could have, I could probably have a hundred one minute videos shot inside of a day. And all of those could be given to my team for the next year. And when we come out of the gate and I'm too busy to do videos, I use this time. So this is the time to be working on the business, right? Working on the coll- the content, on the collateral, building out all of your calendar, your budget, et cetera. SOPs. Perfect time for yeah, all these great, SOPs. great. Again, we're great time to be working on your standard operating procedures or your playbooks, right? Whether you document things in in Process Street or Sweet Process or Google Sheets or Google Doc, whatever you're documenting your processes in. I think Michael Gerber said that best, right? Put all the systems in place as if you're going to franchise it, even though you don't necessarily have the intention to. A franchisee largely has a lot of those SOPs in place. What they should be doing is learning them and following them more, right? Mm-hmm. Moving towards. So, so it just becomes like you just do the same thing every day out of habit. I remember when my kids were young, I had three checklists for them. I had one at their bedroom door. I had one inside the bathroom and I had one at the back door of the house. 
And before they'd leave for school, they had to go through each of the three checklists. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, after about two months, the one in their bedroom didn't need to be there anymore. They made their bed, they picked up their clothes, they turned off the light, they walked out. Of, you know, so, so I could take down that list. But they followed the list and followed the list and followed the list until it became habit. And that's exactly it. And that's what we're doing in our, in our stores. And there's people, if they're just, and too many people are in reactionary mode right now. So the camera just gave a huge long list. If you're not doing everything on that list, just, you know, take a clip of this and send it to your team and have them, have them execute. Cause you should have somebody on your team that can execute this stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, whether that's a virtual assistant, a, an assistant there or your manager, but somebody should be, you should be able to give this video to somebody and they should be able to look at that and go execute it. You know, uh, you mentioned marketing. Um, anyone who's listening should take a look at it. You can probably find the, the name of it and link to it. Mike Arcee from Loud Rumor created, I think, a 42 episode podcast about three weeks ago, created all 42 episodes. It's free. And it's all of the content on how to move your studio to be an online and virtual business during this whole COVID-19 crisis. And he's teaching you how to market it, how to move your clients there, how to sell, how to add value. I forget what it's called, but it's, it's like a COVID-19 podcast specific for studio owners and gym owners on how to actually move to virtual in this whole time. We'll get that Absolutely. link up here. And then um, I'd love to get Mike on here. He's, he's, he's very good at teaching people stuff. He's very, you know, he, he's, he's incredible at that. And he provides so much uh, free resource. To, Super uh, generous guy. Yeah. He's got a good podcast as well. His um, GSD podcast. He's one of my coaching clients. I've been coaching Mike for a year and his second in command is on our CEO Alliance as well. I got a call, uh, a question from uh, Dan Castellini. He's a, a business, he'd been a business partner of mine for years. I think you may have met him before camera. I'm not sure. From a franchisor infrastructure, what should a lean franchise or infrastructure look like? Whether it's now, because a lot of people, let's say they laid off a bunch of people. And sure. now they're coming back and it's perfect, Cameron, right? Because you hire back the people that you want. You say they should have been the only ones working there to begin with, but you hire back the people that you want. And now you have a lean, effective team coming from your perspective, you know, being a COO coach, yeah. what would that whole team look like? So I would pull back on IT. You don't need as much IT as most companies think they do. And I think we're often working on putting IT infrastructure in place that's over, overly expensive that we don't need. So I'd be trimming IT back very, very quickly. You know, accounting and finance, you can really try to get them to be as lean as possible, but you're not going to save a ton. I would have one coach and I would, I would move or migrate to a coaching model that's group coaching where the franchisees come on to group calls, one or two group calls a day, and you can coach them on certain themes or on their businesses. But I'd move a little bit away from the one-to-one and into a group model and keep my best coach. I would keep a PR person. I'd have a full-time in-house PR person who's pitching the media one city per week about the franchisees in the local marketplace and generating press coverage for them. I think it's huge, huge leverage over spending money on marketing and advertising. So I'd trim that one back. I'd probably get rid of any of my graphic design people and um, art people and I would outsource that if I needed to. I would outsource any of my buys. So I'd probably be, sadly, I'd probably be stripping back marketing because I'd just get it on autopilot and leave it there. And then anything around franchisee success, franchisee's confidence, franchisee's training. Like I would, I would really be pouring everything into growing the franchisee skills, growing the franchisee success, coaching the franchisees and getting PR for the franchisees. And once we get that PR, I'd share it on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and drive ad traffic towards the press to drive more credibility. But it would be all about helping the franchisee be successful. And I wouldn't be worrying about adding any more systems for the franchisor at all. Makes sense. So franchisee coaching, you said group coaching, would you, if you had 200 franchisees, would you have them all in just like a large 200 group or would you kind of segment them out? I think the reality is if you got 200 franchisees, 30% of them are never going to show up for anything anyway. You know, so there's, now you're down to, (laughs) now you're down to 140. So you could probably split it into a startup group and a mature group, right? So you now you've got 70 and 70. The reality is you can do group calls with 70 people quite easily because half of them aren't going to show up for each of the calls. So you could probably go to, to you know, two or three groups, maybe. Mm-hmm. The reality is that I think if you have more than 30 people on every call, then maybe you want to split it to give them a little bit more time. But most people aren't going to show up for every call. And then try to run it in themes where you have a call around marketing, or you have a call around sales, you have a call around hiring, et cetera. And then what do you think about recording those calls for, for franchises? I, I go back and forth on that. For sure. 
Yeah, totally, totally record. Because you want to give it to them, right? Hurt you? Well, it doesn't hurt you to do it to record it, and then you can also take that content and strip it out to become blog posts or tweetable things, or anything that's going to be inside content. You can use Otter.ai, and it can record the calls. So then you have more content for your manuals or or training content later. Yeah, that's a good point. Otter.ai, Michael, we use that. Why don't you put that in there? And also, Cameron, you have a book called Free PR. Free mm-hmm. PR, and just give a little a little bit about that because you were talking about that. I've heard you give full-on presentations on that. Yeah. So the book Free PR, um, the genesis of that was about 10 years ago, a company called grasshopper.com asked me to teach them how to do PR in-house and if I would write their PR manual. So David Hauser, the CEO of Grasshopper, paid me to write it. It became a chapter, kind of 20 pages on how to generate free publicity. At 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we landed 5,200 stories about our company within six years without using a PR firm, without sending out a press release. And those were individual unique stories, including being on Oprah. So I took all the content from, from how we did that, because that was the fourth company I'd done it for, and I codified it and then put it out in a book called Free PR. So it's literally the go-to guide on how to generate free publicity for any company. And it steps it out for it gives you step by step. It's like a manual. It gives you the step-by-step instructions on how to get PR, how to pitch it, how to create the stories, and how to build an in-house PR team. We're going into a land of opportunity. Our friend Roland Frazier put out a, a document um, on his Facebook page in, our, in the War Room um, Mastermind the other day, and I put it into this group showing um, EBITDA and, and then multiples, multiples of EBITDA that private equity was paying for different companies. And in recession, you just see it. It just like tanks. The multiples Thanks. go yeah. down. Going into this the land of opportunity where businesses that EBIT, the, the valuation isn't the same that it was before. Even if the EBITDA is the same, the valuation isn't the same. Much of the time coming out of this, EBITDA is going to be very different. It's going to be super weird, Cameron, because we're going to have a period of like no income. And typically when you val- and evaluate a business and put a valuation on it, no income, that really hurts the business. What do you see like the landscape out there um, moving forward? Yeah, so I've been talking to a couple of M&A firms. I've got a couple of my coaching clients right now. We're positioning them to sell so that in six months, we can actually go to market. So right now we're wrapping them up in the bow, right? We're kind of putting them in the blue Tiffany box with the white bow so they look and smell great when we go to market. The, the reality is every single buyer will understand that during the COVID crisis, revenue went to zero. So they're going to take that out of the equation. It's not going to be included. It's not like if, if that had happened last year or the year before, it'd be like, whoa, what the f- your company mm-hmm. just went to zero, be huge red flags. Now it's like, oh, you went to zero. Okay. What'd you have, like? And then like, what would you have for breakfast? Like, it's not even going to be an issue <laughs> for real, right? It, like it won't even be an issue now in valuations because everyone will understand in the history of the world, this has <laughs> never happened, right? Not even during any of the major wars, did we ever shut down movie theaters and restaurants and bar? Like it just never happened. Think about it. I've, and I've had uh, franchisees and franchisors approach me about buying them now. And mm-hmm. let's say it's a membership model and memberships are down somewhere between 10 to 40%. Yeah. And, and that's real right now. And we don't yeah. know how we're going to get those memberships back once we do open. And is it going to be some type of social distancing thing where you can only allow you know 50% of your customers in at a given time? Where do you see valuation in relation to coming out of this being down, really being down, but knowing that you could probably build it back up. There's definitely some threats around it. So I never sell the book value or the P&L of the company when I'm trying to sell a company. What I do is I look for the Rembrandts in the attic. So let's say that you and I were out and we were in, I don't know, Cape Cod, and we both wanted to buy a home in Cape Cod, and we're both bidding to buy the same house on the ocean. And you come in and you're like, two million bucks. And I come in and I go, three million bucks. And another buyer comes in and goes, two million. And you and the other buyer go, why the fuck would Cameron be offering three million? It's only clearly worth two. What you don't realize is I went up into the attic and looked around and I saw two paintings in the attic that were both Rembrandts. Both of those paintings are worth two to three million dollars each. So I'll pay two million for the house, a million for two Rembrandts that are worth about four million total. I'll give you the house because I got more money in the two darn paintings. So in a company, companies have to look for three to five different Rembrandts, three to five things that different strategic buyers will see in value. And then they have to polish those things up so they become very valuable. It could be the database. It could be the clients. It could be the IP. It could be the systems. It could be the management team. It could be access into certain markets or demographics. 
the key is to, if you only sell the P&L and the book value and trailing earnings, you're just like everybody else. So what you have to do is try to find the other things in your company and make those stand out, which is getting press around it, highlighting it on your website, making sure you've got SOPs around it, putting in part of your pitch deck and really making a big thing about it. So then I have one buyer who only wants to buy people and the P&L and the balance sheet. And I've got another buyer who wants to have the PR side. And I've got another buyer who wants the online. Now I have three different buyers looking to buy the business for three different, completely different reasons. And this is the stuff that we all can be working on right now, strategically mm-hmm. and taking action on you know all the stuff that you just mentioned. And it's really increasing the value of the business. And what would you say to somebody right now that just has their head stuck in the sand? Just like, oh my gosh, they're overwhelmed. I think people are going to be selling sure. businesses because they're overwhelmed. They're emotionally not able to handle it. Anybody who's 60 to 70 years old can't do this again. They went through the 2001 downturn. They went through the 2008 downturn. They don't have a third recession in them. They're done. They're burned out. They want out. So that group is really is, is tough and very easy to buy. Anybody who's got their head in the sand and worried and panicked, I'd say start hanging out with people that are positive and energetic and optimistic and focused. You know, misery loves company. Um, stop going down these rabbit holes of all the doom and gloom. Stop reading the news and start, start focusing on growth. And every day, commit to three big things you're going to get done that's going to move your company forward. And then after you've done those three big things, start working on all the busy work. But I think so often people are working on the busy work, they're not necessarily moving the company forward. Yeah, it's so easy to do. So when you say three big things, it's like a three big projects. And then underneath those, it's do one thing to move that project forward or how, how is... No, what are, the three, what are the three things that you have to get done today? And if you've so got be a task, three, it could be a task. So like on my, on my commit to threes today, one, we're set up and test a green screen. So I've got a big 3000 person webinar that I'm doing this afternoon. So I'm even testing, working with you. <laughs> Second one is I want to work uh, one full hour on my course that I'm working on right now. And then the third one is connect with all of my coaching prospects. So I actually have an app called commit to three and right in commit to three, I can show it to you. Um, there's my, oops. Can you see that? Push the, yep. Now we can. You've been out there on social, you're always on social and you're always adding a ton of value. So everybody here should follow Cameron on social. But I noticed one of the things that you did and I sent it a message to some of my friends. You said, I'm going to coach, I think it was 10 people for free and your normal cost to do that. I think it was about $25,000 for, for six months or something, something around there. And you said, I'll do it for free. And you basically pay me if you want to, whatever value that you see in that. Well, why did, and it caught my attention. Yeah. Uh, and I sent that to several friends of mine. And one of the franchises that I'm starting, Cameron, I'm like, I want Cameron to, to coach us. And I know it's, it says free, but it's not free. It's value. So give us some, you know, for everybody out here that is thinking about, they, they try to think differently. How did you come up with that? Well, so it's based on a story from Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And it was a hundred years ago, a guy named Ivy Lee went into a business called Bethlehem Steel. And he talked to a guy named Charles Schwab. And he said, you know, with my systems, you're going to know how to manage better. And Schwab said, I don't need to know how to manage better. I need to get more done. And Ivy taught Charles Schwab the system very similar to commit to three. It was actually making a list of the top five things you have to do tomorrow and then working on those five things. And then he said, you know, six weeks after you try this, try it for six weeks, have your people try it out and then send me a check for what you think it's worth. And that was a hundred years ago. And Schwab sent me a check for 25,000. So I'm sitting here right now looking at businesses who are like, oh, I don't have any cash. I don't have any cash. And I really need to grow. And they're all panicked and nervous. The reality is they just need somebody to hold up a mirror, kick them in the ass, give them ideas, help them pivot, help them get momentum. And then if they do it in the right way and they're the right honest ethical people, at some point, they'll write a check and say, thank you. And if they understand that the value would have normally been, you know, my normal coaching engagement is 48,000 a year. So the normal for six months is 24,000. If they understand that's normal, what people would be paying, hopefully they understand that's reasonably what the expectation should be. You know, if I coach somebody for six months and they only give me, cut me a check for two grand, I'm gonna like, A, you weren't fucking paying attention and B, <laughs> I clearly didn't show you value because on every call, I'm pretty sure that on every, and this is why I set the minimum criteria, they have to do 10 million in revenue for me to start coaching them. If they're doing 10 million in revenue, I can probably find them $100,000 in value on every single call. So after six calls, I can probably clearly show them $600,000 in upside. I'm pretty confident the worst case scenario, they'll, they'll cut me a check for 25 grand. So Cameron, I know, like I've had private conversations, private calls with you. 
And I know you can add that kind of value. Someone sitting out there, like, how can someone charge that much and be that confident? Because I'm really say (laughs) I've done it. Like, so the world's littered with coaches, right? The world has has a ridiculous amount of coaches, but they've never built companies. So Mm -hmm. I took one eight hundred got junk from fourteen employees to three thousand one hundred employees in six years as the chief operating officer. I built the PR team that landed 5,200 stories in six years. We ranked as the number two company in Canada to work for. We opened up in 330 cities and in four countries, and I was the chief operating officer. And that was the fourth company I'd done it with. When I left there 13 years ago, I started coaching CEOs of real companies, typically 50 to 500 employees. I've coached two companies that went on to be number one to work for in Australia. I coached the current number two and number 12 companies to work for on Glassdoor in the United States. I've coached two companies that ranked number two in Canada to work for. I've coached three companies that ranked number one to work for in British Columbia. I coached the current number one company to work for in in Cleveland. I coached the current number one company to work for in the state of Florida. When, When I've got a track record of coaching, and none of these companies have been doing anything before I started coaching them. So I'm just really, really good at it. I suck at all kinds of things. Like, I'm, you know, <laughs> what's, what do you suck at? What, what's what? Oh, if you told me to go into a gym and show you how to do a deadlift, I'd be like, I don't even know what that is. Actually, like, I don't know what a deadlift. Like, I'm terrible in a gym, and I'm intimidated, and I'm bad with numbers, and I'm terrible with IT, but I'm really, really good. I'd say I'm operationally world class at operations, execution, people, and culture. You know, I hired Elon Musk's brother, Kimball back in 1993. And I was a reference for Elon in his first round of funding in January of 95. When I, I, I coached Peter Reeve, who built Solar City, like, I've just done it enough that, that that's the space I'm good in. So I would imagine you are a guy that wants to, you don't want to work on all your weaknesses. You just, no. you just get stronger with your strengths. Yeah, I delegate everything except weakness or delegate everything except strength. So I I was terrible in school at some subjects and I had to go to get a French tutor. I'm terrible at French to this day. And now I don't even like French people, right? (laughs) Because I had to go to this tutor. It's not true, but like, but I had to go to a tutor every single week to get, to get tutored in French. I used to win citywide public speaking competitions in grade school. And now I've got the publisher of Forbes magazine on video saying I'm the number one business speaker he's seen in 19 years. He's the publisher of Forbes magazine. But if I'd had a a coach for speaking through school, I could be world class at speaking. So that's what I'm trying to do now is get coaching and be in mastermind groups around coaching, around speaking and around building masterminds, which are the three real things that I do. So I love, I'm, I'm around these, I mean, that's where we, when you and I met in a mastermind group. Yep. We met in a mastermind group. I, I'm now part of a hundred M M E hundred million mastermind experience, which is a ridiculous mastermind group as well. I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for mastermind groups. And I've given the thought of creating a mastermind group for franchisees and Bedros and I have one for franchise or, but I've been thinking about creating one for franchisees because it's either EO or some of these other ones out there. That was our goal at 1-800-GOT-JUNK was to build our franchisees big enough so they could qualify for EO. When I left the company 13 years ago, we had 10 franchisees who were EO members. Now we have, the, I've been gone again 13 years. They now have 10 franchisees who are YPO members. Hmm. So they're, do, they're doing at least 8 million in revenue with 50 employees. We, we've all of a sudden turned our franchisees into these big business people service-based businesses. Talk about that. Well, let me uh, talk about service-based recession. I mean, you grew up in the painting, painting business and then yep. went into the junk business. Um, uh, auto body, house painting, and oh, then auto right. body, and then, and then junk. Yep. People right now, they're looking at retail and some are going to double down and do very well in retail as, as throughout this and through acquiring and better real estate and all that stuff. Others mm-hmm. are going to want to shift from retail and go into service, just more recession resistant businesses. What would you, uh, what do you say to that person? Services, I like service businesses, but they're hard. I I think all businesses are hard. But what I like about them is if you get the customer engagement right, if you deliver on your promises and create virality in your messaging, your customers will talk about you. Where I really like customer service businesses, if I can engage the female. And and I, I, I need to say this so that people hear it correctly, but females never shut up in a good way. Like they share and they share and they share and they share their experiences. So as an example, let's say that, are you married? Yes. 
So if you if you and your wife went and stayed at a really nice hotel, you, you probably wouldn't tell anybody. And she would probably tell 10 people about the hotel that they stayed in, right? Yep. So if you can create an engagement strategy and messaging with the females, they will explode your brand for you. So that's why I really like service-based businesses where we can target the female. 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we only sold to the female about how lazy her husband was and all she had to do was point and we'd get his lazy <laughs> ass. We'd haul it all the way. Fine. She's like, oh, great. Finally, the garage will be clean. And with, with painting the house, we pretended the guy made the decision, but we knew that the woman was the one letting us onto their property for the week to paint their house. At Boyd Auto Body and Gerber Auto Collision, we understood that every female feels scared and nervous going into an auto body shop or a car, um, any kind of a car place. So we treated them friendly. We wore ties. We had white walls. We had clean floors. We had very female friendly waiting areas. We made it so that women would walk in and go, huh, this feels really nice. And then we treated them with respect. We didn't stand on the other side of the counter from them. We walked around to meet with them. But we had women come in and teach us what would. So that's why I like service businesses. If you get that part correct, the business grows like crazy. I have really smart people like you on my podcast and, and here because I selfishly get to ask some questions that are pertinent to me. <laughs> so sure. what would you suggest for me starting the, the roofing siding and gutter business and as it relates to women and how would you position that? Well, on, on the roofing one, it's probably going to be the guy who's going to make the decision on you know, getting the roof done, but it's definitely going to be the female who wants to decide who comes onto the property. What women are nervous about is the roofers are the first job out of prison, um, that is the reputation, right? Your company, ha they have to show up wearing clean t-shirts that are all branded or clean golf shirts that are all branded. You know, one of my favorite brands is a company out of Vancouver, Canada. They're expanding in the US now, and it's called Men in Kilts Window Cleaning. And it's these guys <laughs> in Canada, right? And it's like, and then on the back of their t-shirts, it says no peaking. And it's just like, but you, you know, they're marketing to the women, right? Like, cause no guy's ever going to think about like peaking up a kilt, but like, and, and I'm sure the women aren't either, but they've just done it this real tongue. So I think if you do a roofing company that has a brand and some fun and, and it is clean and the guys on the roof doing the work are clean and branded and female friendly so that when your teenage daughter comes home, the housewife feels safe having them on property, you win. I would have women creative, women designers, women graphics. I would create um, a look and feel that is very female friendly. And then I would make damn sure you hire consistently on that. Because if, <laughs> if you don't, you lose. Yeah. And I've been, around, I've been around the roofing business. College Pro Painters had College Pro Roofing back in 1986 when I was there. We might have to have a follow-up conversation offline on this yeah. one. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, if anyone else has any questions, uh, put them in now because we're going to be wrapping up. I got a question from John Smith. He said, how much effort or budget would you allocate or to a pivot, not knowing if it's sustainable after, after this whole pandemic? So one of the things that, that I've learned about North Americans, you know, Canadians and Americans is that we often have this idea and then we try to market and sell the idea. I think what I would rather do is go and talk to my customers and find out what they want to buy find out what they need, and then sell into that need. So I'm, I have tons of confidence in pivoting because I've talked to my customers. You know, an example is the, let's say the Second in Command podcast, right? I started a podcast called the Second in Command podcast. We only interview COOs. It was by talking to people and listening. And all of a sudden, I kept hearing people say the same thing. Yeah, they always interview the CEO. It's always the CEO. I've heard that CEO on other podcasts. I want to Somebody said to me one day, I want the rest of the story. And I'm like, ooh. It's like asking a husband and wife, how did you raise your kids? It, she has a very true story. He has a very true story. They're both different stories, but they're both true. So by listening to my market, I was able to create a podcast that targeted the second in command and the listeners to hear the other side of the CEO's story. And I created the COO Alliance because every mastermind group in the world is for the COO and there was, or for the CEO. But the COO is the one really running the company and growing the business. They need the skills as well, and there was no place for them. So I'm really comfortable in putting marketing behind a pivot if my pivot is predicated on my customer's needs. That makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people are in and, and, and fitness because there's the, the needs of a lot of these fitness concepts right now. I'm hearing from the customers that they can't wait to get back into the class. Yeah, the online is great for a segment of them. I mean, I have a Peloton and I love the Peloton, 
but a lot of these customers are can't wait to get back into the into the group. So um, yeah, just don't pivot too hard on this. Right, I, and I would start to figure out what is it they like about being in a group, and how do we make that even stronger? How do we actually get like I've been to you know some F forty five classes, and I've been in some fit body classes, and I've been in some hit classes, and when I suck at all of them, <laughs> and then and then I've got this one yoga studio that I go to, and every class that I go to. This one instructor, only one, the other ones don't do it. She makes you turn to the person next to you and wink at them and shake their hand and give them your name. So guys and girls are all looking at each other winking and we all laugh and then we shake hands and we go, hi, I'm Cameron. And it kind of like breaks the ice a little bit, but she's built, you can see it in her class. The community is stronger. Mm -hmm. People are coming in and they're chatting with each other. And I'm like, she's building this loyal tribe. Like maybe... Maybe the gyms that are in the studios that are going to win are the ones that understand that they can now take the community to the next level. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, there's all kinds of people that have communities where you come in and then you leave and you still don't know anybody's name. Mm. That's not a community. That's just a bunch of people working out together. But imagine if you could get to know each other's names, know some hobbies, learn about each other, sit and have a drink afterwards. You know, maybe you run activities for that group. So now we can actually go on a pub crawl together with people from the gym or we have like a nacho night or a like, I think the ones that win are going to be the ones that really turn the gyms and studios into a community where everybody knows your name like cheers, right? Where you actually know the names of all the other members, then you win. And I think some are starting to do that now, especially with Facebook groups and smaller type things. Like what I wanted to do in the yoga studio that I own is just have more, I want to have my instructors and the people talking to each other in this Facebook group. And that way, new members come in and they see that interaction, especially when they get into the studio. Anything else around creating community now or when they open? So I co-authored the book, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs. And um, Hal Elrod and I wrote the, the entrepreneur version. So The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs. But if you go check out The Miracle Morning Facebook group, He's done an insanely good job at driving community and engagement in that group. Hmm. He's done two things. In the first chapter of the book, it says, stop reading, go to the Facebook group, join, post what you love about the book, and compliment somebody on their first day. So now I'm like, I'll oh, stop reading. I go to the Facebook group. I've done shit. I mean, like today was my first <laughs> miracle morning, right? And then I see somebody else. I'm like, hey, good job on your miracle morning. I might never go back. But he's created a reason for mm -hmm. me to go and to join and to high five someone else in the group. His, the virality and the engagement in his groups is really, 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 really strong. Yeah, think about that. There's, it's, it's easy to put a post out there. And even in this group of the franchise tribe, it, you know, until it starts to take on a life of its own and they start to, everyone starts to get to know each other. And you just don't give content. You ask questions and you, and you do things to create that gamification. Um, so I, yeah, and it's not easy. So everyone should go check out Hal's group. And I've been around Hal and he's just a fantastic guy. Came out of the Crazy. Cutco world. And I know a number of people. Were you Cutco as well? I know I wasn't. I wasn't. A lot of my friends are. No. <laughs> I'm like, everybody I meet from Cutco is amazing. I'm like, God, if they you're are. Cutco too, this is crazy. They are. I've got a, a new friend in here, um, Ryan. He's getting, we are getting ready to put out a, a sales training for franchisees in the beauty space and the fitness space and service mm -hmm. space. Basically, we're going to get on and do a sales training for everybody because the, the, I've noticed this, Cameron. A lot of franchisors are not good at helping their franchisees do consumer facing sales. You know so, who else you should have on your show is John Rulin. Do you know John Rulin? Oh yeah, John. Well, we text. Uh, yeah, we we talk quite a bit, and we were right. on a call yesterday. John's fantastic with giftology. Yep, his Cutco guy. Part, yeah, he's great. And I'm I was written up in chapter one of his book on giftology, but John and I met at a speaking event 15 years ago. And then he sent me this custom engraved knife that is still sitting 20 feet from me with my name on it. It doesn't have his logo. It just has my name. And every time I use the darn knife, I think of John. It's amazing. That's it. You guys, I think you're, I mean, you're getting, if you just listen to this and pick up some of the stuff that we're talking about, even just the connections that we have, immerse yourself into a different world. I wasn't, I didn't know Cameron. I didn't know John. I didn't know anybody except for people in franchising. Until three years ago, I pulled myself out of the franchise world, immersed myself into the marketing entrepreneurial world and paid a lot of money to do it. But the friendships that came out of it are just, you know, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, by the way, is when you're in one community, you think you've, your network has really exploded. 
I think the key is to be in three. Find one that's in marketing, one that's in business development, one that might be in personal and self-help. And then your, your markets start to kind of converge. I always mm-hmm. call it ideas having sex as well. You'll take an idea, <laughs> like I'll take one idea out of the Genius Network. I'll take one idea from the main TED conference and then I'll take one. And then all of a sudden they, they merge together and they become something bigger. I love it, man. Hey, uh, I, I need to let you go uh, so you can prepare for your massive webinar. <laughs> and um, thanks for coming on and helping out the tribe here. Hey, you're welcome, Eric. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. This was fun. Take, take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.